when I first saw this movie back in 2004, I think, I didn't like it. I felt cheated. I felt manipulated. I felt like a fool, honestly. But isn't that what being conned is all about? Let's talk about Matchstick Men. Matchstick Men tells the story of Roy, a depressed con artist with obsessive compulsive disorder, and his partner Frank, who both find their line of work complicated by the arrival of Roy's teenage daughter Angela. Angela brings some spirit back into Roy's life and some of his disorder symptoms seem to disappear. But when Angela wants to learn the family business and Roy allows her to assist on a big scam concerning a businessman, he reconsiders his parenting techniques. The movie stars Nicolas Cage, Sam Rockwell, Allison Lohman, and Bruce McGill. So yes, we're continuing the Ridley Scott review-a-thon, which there's a lot to go, so I need to get busy. Anyway, uh, we're going to start off talking non-spoilers, right? Because, look, this movie deserves to be seen. If you have not seen it, it is available to watch on HBO Max, so yeah, definitely check it out. This movie was executive produced by Robert Zemeckis. So that's kind of an interesting thing is like, I wonder how this movie would have turned out if he had directed it instead. But apparently he got uh, Ted Griffin, the, uh, the, I guess the co-screenwriter along with his brother, Nick Nicholas, basically got him hooked up with Ridley Scott and, uh, yeah, the rest is history. Ridley's now wife, uh, Giannina Faccio apparently was a big fan of Ted Griffin's work and had read all of his scripts. So, uh, when she got a hold of the script, she took you know, gave it a read and, and said, Ridley, you really ought to look at this. And, uh, and he fell in love with it. And three months later they were shooting, which is just a crazy turnaround. If you're a fan of Sam Rockwell, you're going to love this movie. Um, he is so much fun in this movie. He's, he's, he's very playful, but he's also kind of, you know, douchey, you know, sort of a young cocky. I, I just, I love his character and uh, I don't really want to go further into what I think about his character because of spoilers or whatever, but I just, I look, I really loved the, the work that he did here. And if you're a fan of Sam Rockwell and you haven't seen uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which came out a couple of years after this, his Zaphod Beeblebrox is uh, an amazing character and it deserves to be seen by more people. So if you have uh, Amazon Prime or Hulu, you can watch that right now, and and I would highly recommend it. Allison Lohman uh, is just perfect in this role, and she's immediately, immediately likable. Like, you really, really care about her. And uh, I, I really... I really wanted to see more of her, but um, apparently she retired from acting back in 2009. So that's a thing. But uh, but yeah, her acting in this movie is is just superb, especially, I mean, if you think about, you know, she's a, a young actress, you know, acting against Nicolas Cage and Sam Rockwell. That's got to be intimidating, but she, man, she holds her own. Nicolas Cage is, again, one of those actors that, you know, he's really one of the best actors we have, like, period. And, and there's really no question. Um, but this movie in particular... He just gives himself over to this role, and he, the way that he the way that he plays the part of Roy, it's so believable that you just kind of get swept up in it, and you you totally believe it, and you end up really feeling for Roy. You know what I mean? You just you you, you want him to be okay. I found a quote from Nicolas Cage uh, about Ridley and the way that he works that I, I really liked. I went into his office and we had a cigar together and I said, Ridley, I've been reading this script and I think it's OCD, but a little of what I know about obsessive compulsive disorder, there's also a Tourette's component. So I really just wanted to explore the different outbursts, the different twitches, whatever, so that we can have that component. He said, you know what, Nick, you find it and bring it. That was it. That's confident. That's one of the things that, that, you continually hear about uh, about actors that work with Ridley Scott is is that he is he trusts the actors completely and he wants to give every everything to them, including being so prepared, you know, beforehand pre-production and all that stuff. He has his crew prepare so that the actors can come in, do their job with as few takes as possible and just nail it. And I think that's 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 really cool. Prior to doing Matchstick Men, he had done three pretty big movies, you know, Gladiator, Hannibal, and uh, Black Hawk Down, which 
production wise, they were much more complicated. And this was, you know, he, he kind of took this movie as almost like a palate cleanser. And what's, you know, it's at least production wise, when it got to the post-production, things got a little, a little nuts, but, but it's, it's interesting though. The editing has these really almost retro fifties transitions, you know, like, like where the screen kind of comes in and then opens back up. And then there's, there's one where it's, it just kind of tilts up and that the next scene is playing below, you know, it's, it's just an interesting little, little technique that, that he did. The score to the to the movie actually matches that sort of playful feel, you know, almost like Catch Me If You Can. It has that sort of that sort of feel to it. And uh, Hans Zimmer, you know, talked about how difficult it was to nail down the feel of the movie because there's sometimes within scenes the it changes genres and you, know, you have to be able to adapt. I mean, you've got comedy, drama, suspense. Like I said, sometimes within the same scene. So Hans Zimmer's work is really, really good here. It's just, it's not as, uh, I guess, as memorable or as uh, bombastic as some of uh, Hans Zimmer's other scores. Now on the Blu-ray, there's actually a really, really excellent uh, behind the scenes sort of, uh, it's, it's more than a featurette. It's almost uh, it's like an, it's over an hour long, but it goes through pre-production, production, and then post-production really, really fun to, to look at this. And, and some of the, uh, the pre-production stuff is really like inspiring to me, like the, the ability to, to plan so much beforehand, before you get to the set is really, really important for making things run smoothly. In fact, uh, Casey Hodenfield, the, uh, the assistant director for Matchstick Men said that on typical movies, he doesn't really get a whole lot of time to sit down and talk with a director. He'd expected like 15 minutes or something like that with Ridley. But he sat down with Ridley and they spent five and a half hours going through the script page by page, making making sure everything was accounted for and he really appreciated that. There's a scene in the movie that is is really kind of interesting from a lot of different perspectives. It's, it's, it's almost a turning point in the movie, but it's also, well, it takes place in, in front of Dodger Stadium, kind of in a, in a parking lot. And uh, Ridley remembered this, 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 I guess, this location from when he was doing scouting for another movie that he was going to do for Warner Brothers called I Am Legend, which wouldn't come out until five years later, which is, I don't know, I think that's kind of cool. But he remembered that from his, from his scouting and said, this is where this scene should take place it really could have been set anywhere. It could have been set in an office or a parking garage or anything, you know, just whatever. But Ridley says, no, it should take place in front of Dodger Stadium. It, it's got this this scope to it that it just, it's, it's the beauty of working with Ridley Scott, apparently. If you'd asked me back in 2004 what I would have thought of this movie and what I would have rated it, I probably would have given it like, I don't know, a two out of four stars because I was so mad, I was so angry at the, at the movie for, for what it did to me. But, but you know what now, especially with, with being able to watch it a couple more times, being able to sit and think about it, man, this movie is a 3.5 out of four. So now it's spoiler time. So if you haven't seen Matchstick Men and you want to, uh, like I said, it's available over there on HBO Max. Go ahead and watch it before you uh, watch this part of the video, because I'm going to, I'm going to give away like the ending and, and things. And I don't want to, I, I don't want to spoil it for you, you know, and you should watch it. It's really good. So anyway, without further ado, let's just get into it. One of the, I would say aha moments for me was watching the special features and Ted Griffin, one of the, the co-screenwriters, he's talking about after reading the book, right? That this, this story was based on and how angry he was because he felt angry and he felt manipulated. And he said everything that he was emotionally invested in was just a lie and it was just a con. And I'm like, that, that's exactly how I felt after watching the movie. But he said that what happened was originally the first draft was basically all real. So Angela was actually Roy's daughter. I mean, everything was true. There was no con there. There was no twist at the end. And of course, when they went back and said, no, we need to, we need to put this in. It's, it's what really sells the story. Everything was richer. You know, the, the, the con itself made more sense and it, and it just, it worked even better because they approached it originally from the aspect that no, that 
Angela was actually Roy's daughter. I found that I found that so interesting and and it made me appreciate what they did in the movie even more. Now, like I said, I'd watched the movie before, so I already knew what the ending was. So it was it was really fun watching it again and seeing the different tells, especially Sam Rockwell. There are moments where you can tell he's like he's like man, am I really doing this? Am I really going to do this to my mentor, the guy that taught me everything? You know, it was really, really cool stuff. And you see that from Alison Lohman's character, Angela, as well. She just, she's, it's, it really is beautiful work. And very, very smart. Um, one of the things Ridley said about the, the actual edit is that originally all of the tells that they'd kind of set up were all in the movie and he took out a bunch of them because he didn't want it to be too obvious that yeah Roy was being played. I'm still not completely sold on the way that the movie ends. Right? I mean the there's the scene with Roy and Angela at the uh the carpet store and you know it's it's nice and sweet and I almost felt like that should have been where it ended but I just wasn't, I just wasn't too crazy about the, I guess, almost like a post coda thing. It's like another ending almost where Roy goes home and he sees his pregnant wife, who was the cashier that you've kind of seen throughout the movie. It just felt, it felt too, like too much, like too sugary sweet and almost like this big Hollywood type ending. I didn't really care for it and I still don't. Um, I mean, it's fine. It's fine. It just, I don't know. There's um, one of the things that they talked about the edit, which made me go, yes, that would have been, it would have worked better for me, is there's a scene sort of, I guess, when when you can see Roy's progress, you know, with, with Angela being in his life, and he sort of actually makes contact with the cashier and, and kind of has an interaction, a real human interaction with her. Um, that's in the movie, but it's, sort of like at the two thirds mark, you know, where you can kind of see his progress. Originally, they had said that, that was the ending, that they moved that to the end. And that was sort of how the movie was gonna was gonna end. I actually like that because I don't like everything being spoiled, you know, spelled out for me, you know, I, I want things to be a little bit open ended, I guess, and your your own imagination can run with it and you can imagine that, oh yeah maybe they they went out and they they dated and they got married and they had kids and all that stuff is very sweet and all that but I would have liked to have come to that conclusion on my own rather than just being shown it still though Matchstick Men I mean the movie's the movie's great I, I really really enjoyed it I enjoyed revisiting it and especially coming at it from a perspective of you know being a Ridley Scott fan and the Ridley Scott review-a-thon I, look, I, 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 I really enjoyed it. And every time I watch special features with Ridley, I get inspired. I, I'm so inspired by the way that he works, the way that he approaches his actors. I just, I love it. I just love this stuff. So tell me, you tell me, do you like Matchstick Men? Have you seen it? Did you like it? Let me know down below. We'll talk about it. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. So thank you all so much for watching and we'll see you on the next one.